Good evening. You are listening to LPJ. Speaker Radio with Mr. and Mrs. Sweet Thing. How are you today? Happy Friday. I am doing just fine. And how are you doing? I'm doing fine and a little on the chilly side, but that's all right. I'll tell you, the devil is busy. They had to rush my brother to the hospital last night, so we, that's why we, wasn't, we here. wasn't here last night, but that's okay. He's that's doing okay. just fine. Praise the Lord. He's doing fine. Thank God. We're here tonight, and we're going to praise the Lord anyway. And, that's right. And we're going to have a good time in the Lord, even though the devil is busy trying to put a stop on things, but that's okay. Uh, it just tells me that I'm, I'm serving the right master because the devil is busy. That's right. We... Just want to thank the Lord and thank you for joining us tonight. And the title tonight is Jesus, the Faithful Witness. Yes. Yes, he is. And so I hope that you are doing fine and everything. Has, God has blessed you throughout this week, have covered your family and taken care of you and keeping the enemy away from you and your family. And I hope that everything went well for you. Uh, uh, your family this week and you and yourself and if he did uh, uh, you've been blessed I know you're blessed if you're listening to uh, Miss Sweet Thing and I know that thing has went well for you and if he didn't don't take it as uh, uh, feeling bad or that why did it happen said Lord thank you I'm serving the right one because the enemy is on me and That's just right. take all in joy Amen and we just I want to thank you so much that you're able to come and enjoy and praise the Lord no matter what you're going through. And just thank him for a blessed week that you was able to make it through. And we've got a scripture tonight. And again, this is um, Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us. And washed us from our sins in his own blood. Amen to that. Amen to that. You heard that right here on LPJ. Love, Love, peace, peace, and joy. joy. Yeah. 
Jesus, won't you heal the land? Come on, 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 Jesus, won't you heal the land? Don't you worry, God is making 
Thank you. He loves you.
for some who don't understand our purpose and may not understand our praise where's the family in Jesus name I would like to tell you the reason why we sing
You're the hymn in my heart, Jesus. You're the reason why. You're the reason why. Oh, I love you. I love your name, Jesus. Glory, hallelujah. For the rest of my life, Jesus, you'll be the reason why I sing.
three, don't be cute. Whatever you desire from God in this room, as an act of faith, I want you to lose your mind for about ten seconds and just jump up and get it. One, two, three, go! Mama, let me get away with it. I get away with it, but I know I can't. He made a way. He made a way. He made a way. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 oh. He made a way. Point to yourself for me. Whatever you desire in Him, it's already yours. You gotta have a thank you attitude. How many know God will respond to thank you? Can't think of nothing to pray for. Just tell him thank you. Thank you. It's not only that faith and order. You can get it right now. He's not on the way. He's already here. So I got to ask you that question. Son. You know, we sing night after night, city after city. People always come up to us and question us. They ask, 
Why do we do the things we do? The answer is simple. It's because we love Jesus and we, we love you. to do all I can to give you the glory. I will lift my voice in song and in praise to tell your wonderful story.
number of people developing diabetes in North Carolina has more than doubled in the past 20 years. But as News 13's Jay Silser shows us in today's Health Alert, a program in McDowell County aims to help diabetics turn around their overall health. It's far more than a blood pressure check at the YMCA in Marion. It's also a first effort to take control of type 2 diabetes or too much sugar in the blood. We are looking at people uh, being diagnosed five years or less. We're, that's where we're starting. Participants meet together routinely and improve fitness individually. Adding the proper exercise with proper eating habits, it has given me new life. We are seeing really awesome results and we're very excited about that. We have numerous people who have uh, had their medicines decreased. We have some who are completely off their diabetes medications. Here at 66, I didn't think it was possible for me to feel like I feel now. I basically lost about 50 pounds, more energetic. And moving better than ever while reducing chances of everything from neuropathy to heart disease to stroke all commonly associated with diabetes. In Marion, Jay Siltzer, News 13. Well, the program is by doctor referral only. It's funded by a grant and it will last one year. In the life of a child of God who's walking in the will of God, there are no such things as just these uncertain kind of circumstances. God is engineering the circumstances of our life for what is best if we will walk in His way. And somebody might dispute it, but they can't prove it with the Word of God. And I've lived long enough to tell you it is absolutely the truth. The truth. Anything else would be inconsistent with who God is. Welcome to In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley. We're glad you've joined us. Dr. Stanley continues his Life Principles series today with a message titled, God Will Show You His Will, explaining that we grow in faith through the process of seeking the Lord. Stay with us as Dr. Stanley offers eight practical steps to walking in God's will. Well, God loves you just the way you are. And he desires to enable all of us to become everything we can possibly become and achieve what he wants us to achieve in life. That is, he has a purpose and a plan and a will for every single one of us. And he's more than willing to show us what that is, if we really and truly want to know. And the interesting thing about God's will is, oftentimes we think about it in terms of just the big picture. Here's what God wants me to do in my life or achieve or accomplish. But all of that is only a part of him showing us his will day by day in decision after decision after decision. Think of all the decisions we make in any given day, and God has a purpose and a plan and a will for all of those. There may be some insignificant things. It doesn't make any difference what you do about it, what color shoes you wear, or socks, or shirt, or whatever it might be. But when it comes to decisions, God is interested in all those decisions because they flow out of our heart and their indication of what's in the heart. Now, how do I know that? First of all, because he says so, but, but listen to this. That's characteristic of God. In other words, it's consistent with who he is. How could God expect you and me to do what he wants us to do and if he doesn't tell us? So it's consistent with who he is, that he has a desire for our life, and having that desire, he not only wants us to know what it is, but he is committed to showing us what his will and purpose and plan is. Now, that is true of a person who's made this first decision. When a person receives Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, the Bible says several things have happened, and I'll mention them quickly. We are forgiven of our sins. We are redeemed by His blood. We are justified, declared no longer unrighteous. And we are sanctified, set apart for Him, and glorified already. And so, that being true, God wants to enable us to become everything He has in mind, every day of our life, if we will follow Him, walk in His way, and if we will choose, if we will choose in those decisions. Now, that's consistent with Him. A second reason we can believe it is because of what He promises in the Word. For example, if you ask me to uh, sign uh, your Bible, I would put this verse under my name more than likely, the 16th uh, Psalm, if you happen to want to turn to that, uh, and the uh, 11th verse. You will make known to me the path of life. 
you'll make known to me the path of life, and your presence is fullness of joy. And as he says, at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And then I think about uh, Colossians uh, uh, chapter 1 in this awesome verse of Scripture, in this particular passage. Here's what Paul says. He says, in the light of the way the Colossian people have been living, how grateful he was. And he says in the ninth verse, this first chapter, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, that is of your love and devotion to Christ, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all knowledge and wisdom and understanding. So think about it. For God to show you how he wants you to live out your life is consistent with who he is. Secondly, he's got promise after promise in the Word of God. Now, let me say this. God will sometimes go to extreme, to the extreme to show you what his will is for your life when you really and truly want to know what it is. Now, it's very evident, according to the Scripture, that he will show us his will, that that's his desire. So, then the question comes, that is, All right, so how do I find out? I I believe that he has a will for my life. He loves me unconditionally. How am I going to find out what it is? So I would make some suggestions here, and I will just simply say this. Very early in my life, very, very early in my life when I was a teenager, God just planted the desire in my heart to be obedient to him and to follow him. And so I had to figure out, well, how do I do this? And so one of the things that I learned very quickly is if I really wanted to find out, Go back in the Old Testament and see, well, how did you work in the lives of these men and women in the Old Testament? How did you show them your will? And how did you speak to them? And how did they know for certain? So let's begin with this one. That is, if you're going to discover the will of God, it begins with the Word of God. Because this is where we find the heart of God. This is the way we're led day by day in making decisions. He says in that 119th Psalm, the 105th verse, he says, His Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. He says the entrance of his word gives us light. That is spiritual light, wisdom, and understanding. If you neglect the word of God, you're going to get out of the will of God because there are so many voices out there telling you what you ought to do and how you ought to do it and oftentimes criticizing the word of God. And so the truth is it's his primary way of speaking to us. If somebody says, well, I'm trying to find out what God wants me to do, first thing I say to him, you need to get in the Word of God and start reading. You say, where do I read? Here's the interesting thing about the power of God's Word. If somebody wants to know the will of God and is willing to get in the Word of God, it's amazing how He will lead you to the verses, the very verses of Scripture that God will give you direction. So what I want to do is I want to give you all these ways that help you determine what God's Word says and what His will and what His way is for your personal life. And remember this, if somebody says to you, well, this, here's what I'd do. Well, if I were you, well, they're not you. And the will of God is not the same for everybody. So God in His love for us has made it possible for you and me to know without a shadow of a doubt, without a question, what His will is in any given situation. Otherwise, it'd be inconsistent. How does he expect me to know something if he doesn't show me? He's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows the beginning. He knows the end. He knows the consequences. He knows what's wise, what's unwise. He knows what his plan was before he ever created us. So it would be inconsistent with his nature and character not to show us. And the first place you want to go is the Word of God. And this is why Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 has been the anchor verse in my life all these years since I was an early teenager. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, all of them, not some of them, acknowledge Him, look to Him, trust Him, seek Him, and He'll direct your path. That is, a, listen, that's an unwavering promise, and everybody ought to have it as an anchor in their decision-making process. This is our assurance. Here's what He promises. So first of all, the Word of God. The second thing is prayer. That is, if I'm going to find out what the will of the Lord is, I need to ask Him. In other words, reading the Word, I need to ask Him, Lord, what is your will in this given matter? What decision do you want me to make at this point? How, how am I to handle this? I am to ask Him. With that asking, equally is listening. I must be willing to ask Him, then I must be willing to listen to Him. Now, 1 John chapter 5, 14th and 15th verses, 
are my anchor verses when it comes to prayer. He says, this is the confidence, the assurance, the boldness that you and I have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we have the petition that we desire of him. If I'm listening, he's going to show me. Remember, it's consistent with being who he is. You would not expect your children to do the right thing if you never tell them what the right thing was. If you want them to do something but you wouldn't tell them, well, you all guess, that wouldn't be fair. And so God doesn't operate that way either. Now listen carefully. If you're reading the Word and if you're praying and uh, you're not getting anywhere, are you listening? Say amen. amen. Then you look on the inside of you because it is not God who's withholding the truth. It is not God who is not willing to speak. Oftentimes, there's something on the inside of our thinking, the way we think about something. We've already made up our mind about something. Or we have some prejudice in our heart against doing this or that. And so we, we've decided, well, I'm not sure about it. And so you need to look inside and ask God, is there anything on the inside of my heart that's not right? So I've got to be in the Word. I've got to be asking. Now, somebody says, well, if, how long do I have to ask Him? Listen carefully. As long as is necessary for you to get in the position spiritually so he can tell you. So therefore, the length of time depends upon how willing you are to listen and if the timing is right. But to withhold it from you purposely, he would not do it. There's a time, for example, oftentimes when he's waiting for something else to be right before he's going to show us what it is. So you've got to be in the Word. Secondly, there's prayer. And then there, of course, sometimes he shows us by circumstances. So that every aspect of our life, and I want you to see this, every aspect of our life is important. Circumstances. Sometimes God, knowing our heart, knowing our willingness, knowing that we want to know what's right and do his will and get in his will, he'll allow things to happen that at first we think is a mistake, you know, blame somebody else. And we're quick to blame people, for example, that we think wronged us when it may be that God just used them to get us heading in the right direction because of what he wanted to do. And I can tell you this, most of the time, 99% of the time, God just saved that person from making a mistake. Because we all can head in a particular direction because it looks like the right thing to do. Uh, it, it looks profitable. It looks like we all agree and so forth. If it's not God's will and you're praying, God, show me your will for my life. Show me your will for my life. I'm trusting you. In the circumstances, God shuts one door. And what does he do? He never closes one without opening one. Our problem is, before he opens the next one, we're going, please open this door, God. And that's not what he wants. He wants us to wait. Because remember this, in the circumstances, it may be that the best thing he could have for you, he's got to work on you first and get yourself cleaned up or change your attitude about some things. So he is interested in every single aspect of your life, and circumstances are certainly a part of it. And I could give you lots of examples of how that's worked in my own life, things that I thought, well, Lord, this couldn't possibly be of you and didn't take long to realize, God, this was you after all. Little things, for example, and I've, I've given more detail. I'll give you just a briefing. I was up in the mountains, my wife and I, uh, spending the summer. And a church up there, their pastor was on vacation, and they couldn't find anybody to preach. So he finds out that I'm down the lake and comes down and asks me, uh, would you be willing to preach two Sundays? Or preach one Sunday? I mean, it was, it was a circumstance. I knew nothing about the church, nothing about anybody up there. End up becoming their pastor and teaching in the Bible Institute. It looked like a circumstance. Listen, in the life of a child of God who's walking in the will of God, there are no such things as just these uncertain kind of circumstances. God, listen to this, God is engineering the circumstances of our life for what is best if we will walk in His way. And somebody might dispute it, but they can't prove it with the Word of God. And I've lived long enough to tell you it is absolutely the truth. The truth, anything else would be inconsistent with who God is. Then, of course, there's godly counsel. Very important. Somebody says, well, you know, sometimes you can get in trouble listening to other people. Absolutely. So I want to give you a key about that. If you're going to somebody to ask for godly counsel, let's say, for example, that you're struggling, you're really trying to find out His will, and this is a critical situation, you just want to be sure. So you want to go talk to somebody. Well, let me say, first of all, listen carefully. You listen and say Amen. You find out 
what kind of lifestyle that person is living themselves before you go asking them about what God is saying to you. Did you get that? You be careful who you ask. So number one, the person. And here's the second thing. You need to watch this now. You don't ask them this question. You don't say, what do you think in this given situation I should do? Wrong question. Well, say, what do you ask? Here's what you ask. In this given situation, what do you think the Word of God says I should do? There's a lot of difference in those two questions. In this situation, what do you think God says about what I should do? That puts it all back on the Word of God. Then you're still walking in the right direction. But ungodly advice is terribly destructive. Then, of course, there's your conscience. Our conscience is the moral filter in our life. God's given every single one of us one. The more of the Word of God is in your conscience, the more accurate you can make decisions. Now, some people's conscience has already been seared by their continuous devotion to sin and wickedness and so forth. So when you say, somebody says, just let your conscience be your God. No, 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 you can't do that. It depends on how your conscience has been trained. Otherwise, you make big mistakes. So the conscience is a very important part of this. And uh, when I think about that, I think about how oftentimes uh, people say, well, I'm, I'm just going to trust my conscience. Remember this, you send your conscience through the Word of God. In the light of what God says, is this really what I should do? So you can't just leave it up to conscience because the conscience must be purified by the Word of God to come to the right conclusion. Then, of course, there's this whole idea of a restless spirit. Now, you say, what's that got to do with it? Well, I'm just giving you my own personal experience here. Here's what I've discovered. Any time, as I look back over the years, any time God wanted to change something about the way I was thinking, what I was going to do, the direction I was moving in, I'd get very restless. And that's God's way by His Spirit of gently getting our attention. Because you can just be on your way heading in this direction thinking this is what God wants me to do. But somehow deep down inside... There's something sort of going on. And I can think of a number of things that come to my mind at this point. That usually when he wants to change something, it makes me restless. Now, otherwise, you'd be moving along and bang, God says, this is my will. Well, sometimes he knows that'd be too big of a shock. So he gets us restless. And what happens is restlessness gets us on our knees. And we begin to ask, Lord, what are you saying to me? And I can think of... A number of big time, major, probably the, the most major decisions of my life have always been, come after a period of restlessness and seeking the Lord's will, saying, God, what would you have me to do? And then, of course, uh, one step at a time. Most of the time, God isn't going to say, I want you to do this today, that next month, 10 years from now, here's where I want you to be. No. One step at a time. The walk of faith is a step at a time. Remember what he said to Abraham? He said, Abraham, get up, leave your family, and go into a land that I will show you. First of all, you've got to leave them, and I'm going to show you as you go. 16th chapter of Acts, when Paul was heading toward the, the east to preach the gospel, and God stopped him and headed him another direction. Uh, what was he doing? Well, he started out on his second missionary journey. He was doing what God called him to do, but he was doing what would be natural for him, and that is where he was to preach the gospel in that area. God said, no, I want you to go to a different area. And so one step at a time, that's the way he carried out all of his missionary journeys. And the truth is, think about this, you and I only live a split second at a time. And so if somebody's waiting for God to show them the next 10 years, you can forget that. In fact, you know, big businesses or churches, nobody can make plans for five years anymore. Why? Because things change so fast. You can look ahead, but when it comes to specific plans, you have to be very careful about that. And then the last thing I would say would be this. And that is sometimes he'll use very unusual manifestations. For example, look where Moses was. Backside the desert, he'd been for 40 years. And so for God to speak to him, he knew that in order to get Moses' attention when he'd been away from Egypt for 40 years, he left running because he'd killed an Egyptian soldier. God had to deal with him. Well, 40 years, how little did he know about God? So what does God do? 
He gives him a burning bush experience that was no question in his mind that God had spoken to him. And the same thing back into this uh, chapter in the Acts about Paul. What happened was that God changed his mind, but how did he do it? He saw a vision of a man in Macedonian Philippi. That is a vision in the West. And so everything in his human reason would say, well, I'm to preach the gospel here. He said, no, I want you to go there. And to get his attention, make it absolutely clear to him, he gave him a vision to make it happen. So there are eight ways to at least, if a person really and truly wants to know the will of God, God will show you if you really and truly want to know his will.
One song that we wrote that means a lot to me is a song that Paul Balash sang, and it's called Helpless. And it just talks about being helpless without the Lord. For someone to sing about complete surrender, acknowledgement that God is so big and we're so small, it's such a beautiful thing, it's such a vulnerable thing, but it's also a way to receive His love. It's hard to receive anything when we're closed off. But to open ourselves up and to say, Lord, I can't do anything without you, that's, it's something that I think he likes to hear. And I think it makes him smile. It's so interesting. You'll, you'll sing things that you might not say. So I think through the melody and the music, this message is able to cut through, you know, to the heart and just really get you to realize something that you may not quickly say, you know, that when you really think about it, you're, you're really helpless without the Lord. I am helpless. And my heart is crying out for you. Jesus, without your presence, there is nothing I can do. I'm held. Brother Joe May, they call me the Thunderbolt of the Middle West. If you'd never heard the volcanic voice of Brother Joe May, you might have thought his nickname, the Thunderbolt of the Middle West, was a little exaggerated. But once you heard this booming tenor tear into a song, there was no longer any doubt that Thunderbolt was indeed an accurate and affectionate description of one of the greatest male gospel singers ever. He had a range, a vocal range, that is really unparalleled, on a, a unique voice, and his presence was powerful. And not only that, he, he, he wrote some great songs, something uh, like, Search Me Lord. Um, if you find anything. And I heard one preacher say, now he gonna find something. 
Born in Macon, Mississippi in 1912, Joe May began singing at the age of nine. He got the name Brother from his church, where he sang as a young man before moving to East St. Louis with his family in 1941. That's where he met and became the protege of the legendary Willie May Ford Smith. It was Smith who dubbed him the Thunderbolt. Brother Joe May was not only a major figure on the gospel circuit, his first two records were monster hits. Search Me Lord, released in 1949, and Do You Know Him, released a year later, became million sellers and solidified his claim as the top male soloist of gospel's golden age.
lead me, Lord, I will follow. The song of our lives. It was not too long ago that a record company called us and asked us to write a missions musical. Uh, Dale Matthews said, Wayne, we really need a song that everyone can just respond to at the end of this musical. And so Elizabeth and I began to just ask God to give us what we should say. I came home one day and she had started writing, lead me, Lord, I will follow. And uh, sat down, we worked together on it. And so we, we wrote the whole first verse and chorus and thought that's where we would end with it and sent that to the company that we were working with. And we did the whole musical and the people responded at the end as we began singing that chorus, lead me Lord, you have called me and I will answer. So we sent a recording of that to Brooklyn Tabernacle and they heard that song, the last song, and went to church one Sunday and just started singing the chorus. And Pastor Jim told me later, he called me, he was deeply moved and he said, Wayne, we started singing Lead Me, Lord. And he said the whole congregation started singing it. And before we knew it, people were stepping out of the aisles and just coming to the front and just falling down and and just giving their hearts to God. And he said, uh, we've just sung it every service since. Then I got the call. They were going to do a, a concert at Madison Square Garden and wanted to know if Elizabeth would come and sing the solo with the choir there. And so we did that the summer uh, it was July and hot summer, but we went.
Born in Brooklyn, New York in 1925, Marie Knight didn't waste any time establishing herself as a force in gospel music, beginning her remarkable career in the choir of the Oakwood Avenue Baptist Church in Newark, New Jersey. Starting in 1946, it was her association with Sister Rosetta Tharp that really put Marie Knight in the pantheon of gospel greats. I want to meet all of my brother. They teamed up with duets on songs like the chart-topping ballad Precious Memories and Up Above My Head, which Knight still performs. Up above my head, up above my head, joy in here, joy in here. Marie Knight was never one to limit herself, however. She also recorded with other artists, secular and non-secular alike, including the Dependable Boys, the Sam Price Trio, and even former heavyweight boxing champion Jersey Joe Walcott. Knight's willingness to cross over often put her at odds with her church-going fans, but she was not deterred. In 1965, she even had an R&B hit, Cry Me a River. But today, after more than six decades of making music, she has returned to her gospel roots, continuing to perform and tour and reprising songs from her days with Rosetta Tharp. Marie Knight, a member of the Gospel Music Hall of Fame, is a true gospel great.
wash me through and through Anoint me, Lord Make me brand new Come on and wash on Wash on Lord, please fill it up I need your power Oh, the Holy, Holy Ghost Come on, I'll ask you Wash all of my sins Wash them all Oh, you say the same.
gonna be yeah, his kind of woman. the word longevity I would say the Williams brothers have been there for a long time and they are still there very strong now uh, this is a group that you can't call a quartet uh, you can't call them a group you have to call them the Williams brothers because they're very strong and wherever they appear around the country they really uh, pack them out there is perhaps no other family name more synonymous with good gospel music than the Williams brothers and they've been at it for 45 years ever since Leon Pop Williams first formed the trio in Smithdale, Mississippi in 1960. They've been around a long time. Uh, Doug Williams, um, uh, that was Leonard, uh, there was Melvin, and I think the duo now is Doug and, and Melvin more or less. And, and they just keep, they, people just enjoy hearing them. The recipients of three Grammy nominations and numerous stellar awards, the Williams Brothers are in a class by themselves. Enshrined in the International Gospel Hall of Fame in 1999, they have an impressive 18 top 10 albums, including three number one hits. They performed at some of the nation's most famous and distinctive concert halls, from Harlem's famed Apollo Theater to Carnegie Hall to the Grand Ole Opry House and Radium City. The Williams brothers are not just prolific performers, they're astute businessmen. In 1991, they formed their own label, Blackberry Records, which became the first black-owned and operated record label in Mississippi with major distribution. People just like to look at them. They're handsome men, number one. Uh, number two, uh, they can really sing. It was no coincidence, perhaps, that a song from their first album on their new label, This Is Your Night, rose to number four on Billboard and was nominated for a Grammy. And after four decades of praising God through their music, the Williams Brothers are still standing tall. We are still standing tall, yeah. you see God is on.
in a world of sin But grace and mercy It took me in Took my feet out Of the miry clay And placed them on On a rock to stay Oh, what a relief it was When God rescued me mm -hmm. He loosed the chains that had me bound And it felt like cool and water, cool and water, cool and water. It felt like cool and water, cool and water, cool and water, cool and water from Grandma's well. Be with your job, sleepless nights, and so much pain. Couldn't see no sunshine, nothing but rain. But God said we've been made, endure for our night. But in the morning. It will be alright Oh, what a relief it was When God rescued me He loosed my chains And had me bound And then He set me free Felt like Felt like Just like Just like
to you. Listen. Father, 
up your children Don't let them fall By the side Of the road And teach them To love one another That heaven might their hearts Cause Jesus is love He won't let you down Strong, who can help you to hold on just a man of 
Campy Russell, former power forward for the Cleveland Cavaliers. Did you know that stroke is the number four cause of death and a leading disabler for all Americans? And stroke does discriminate. In fact, African Americans are twice as likely to suffer a first ever stroke than any other race or ethnicity. But you have the power to end stroke. If you experience sudden numbness or weakness of the face, arm, or leg, especially on one side of the body, sudden confusion, trouble speaking or understanding, sudden trouble seeing in one or both eyes, sudden trouble walking, dizziness, loss of balance or coordination, or a sudden severe headache with no known cause, you could be experiencing a stroke. Stroke is a medical emergency, and if you suspect that you or a loved one is experiencing a stroke, don't delay. Call 911. The good news is stroke is largely preventable. Don't take a gamble with your health. By taking care of yourself through healthy eating, regular exercise, and avoiding tobacco smoke, you can reduce your risk for stroke and score a slam dunk. Be sure to keep your blood pressure in check. Watch your salt intake and take medication as prescribed by your doctor. Maintain a healthy weight. By losing just 5% of your weight, you can reduce your risk. Be sure to keep active. Find something you enjoy and strive for 30 minutes of activity most days of the week. If you have diabetes, be sure to monitor your blood sugar and work closely with your doctor to keep it under control. And if you smoke, quit now. Score some healthy habits each day. Reduce your risk for stroke and make a power move with your health. Learn more about healthy habits that can be a game changer for you. Visit PowerTheEndStroke.org. We have the power to end stroke, and so do you. You know, there are too many people trying to take care of other folks' business. And they can't even take care of their own. But what you need to do is take six months to mind your own business. And six months to leave other folks' business alone. All I'm trying to say is... Sweep around your own front door Before you try to sweep around my mm -hmm. Sweep around your own front door Before you try to sweep around my Now this is what you do You smile in your neighbor's face And you talk about them Behind their backs Y'all know you do this But if you found out They were doing the same thing to you You know You wouldn't like that Well Tell me this Who are we to judge What other people do Take a look at yourself You'll find some wrong shoes Sweep around your own door Before you try well, well, well You need to sweep around your own front door Before you try to sweep around mine Here's another thing, yo You're always on the telephone Putting down on someone else Y'all know y'all do that But you need to take a little time to stop Look in the mirror and check yourself And here's the reason why Cause we all have sinned and come short Of God's glory today So we don't have time to spread here and say
listening to LPJ. Speaker Radio with Mr. and Mrs. Sweet Thing. That's the truth. Speak, speak around, around your, your own, own back, front, your own front, front door. door before you try to speak around mine. <laughs> of course, you know, you got your own dirt. You worry about yours. Don't mm-hmm. have ter- time to worry about mine. That is true. And that you was know. a William brother one. Yeah, it? William brother. That's that's very true. We sweep just around worry. Our own. sweep around your own front door first. By the time you get through sweeping up your dirt, you'll be too tired to worry about mine. We got so much trash ourselves. Yeah, Lord so, help us. Yes, <laughs> we've had a great time. Yes, lifting up and praising the Lord here on our Speak Radio tonight. It's been so beautiful, wonderful. Cozy outside, just laying back, praising the Lord, listening to his music. Amen. Music and food for the soul, body, mind. Mind. It's so wonderful. We've had a great time. But the clock on the wall says it's time to go and uh, all that good stuff. But we'll be back back tomorrow night, better believe it. Yes, we will. With more music, I tell the Lord, really. And we'll be back. Like I said, the devil's been busy this week. My brother was in the hospital last night. We couldn't make it. We had to go see him. They rushed him there, but the, the devil didn't, didn't stop nothing we hear tonight. That's right. We're back again. We're back again. Lord. So we, uh, it's time to go, but we will be back. But before we go, we got a scripture for you. Yes, we do. And this is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21 through 24. If indeed you heard him and were taught in him, even as truth is in Jesus, that you put away as concerning your former way of life, the old man, that grows corrupt after the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man who, in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. And that means uh, when you become a Christian, you put you're a new creature. You're a new creature. You put away some of them old ways, oh, yeah. old things you used to do. Renew your mind. Renew, you renew your mind. Mm-hmm. Become a new person. Let some of them old things go. I ain't, I'm not going to say you don't let a lot of all of them go because it, it's a it's a whole life job until you die. Mm-hmm. You're going to be doing it, but. Some things you need to just put down right then and there right. and let go of. And then there's some things you have to continue to work at. I need to see a new walk with a new talk. Amen. Then that way you know that you know Jesus. We all have to work on it. Those fruits of the Spirit. Yes. Uh, as we say, before we go, we always have to talk to the Lord and thank Him and um, say the right things at the right times, you know, as a Christian, mm-hmm. change the, the attitude. But well, we must talk with the Lord before we go and thank Him. I have any Father, we come before you tonight thanking you, Lord, for this day that you've given us. You don't have to give it to us, Lord, you didn't owe us anything. But your grace is sufficient enough for us that we, you let us see this day come and go as always. As well as our family, Lord, you touch them and give them another day. And, and let them see it. Lord, there's so many of us that we seen this day come. Some of us are in the hospital. Some of us are sick at home in the bed. But yet, we have opportunities to see this day come and go. We thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for this day. Even in our trials and tribulations, we, we thank you, Lord, because you're good. We were still able to see it come and go. Mm-hmm. Lord, now we come before you at your throne, asking you to forgive us for our sins, our hidden sins, anything that we may have done or said in this day, Lord, that was displeasing to you. I want to ask you, Lord, to forgive us for those things. Ask you, Lord, to continue to work with our minds, our body, and our souls. Clean us up, Lord. We know that we continue to need to be clean, washed. Because we as no better as a dirty, filthy rag. And we know a rag that's dirty and filthy has to be washed and clean every day. Lord, we just ask you to continue to wash and clean us every day. Because we need that. We come before you every day, Lord. Throw ourselves before your throne and ask you to wash us and clean, clean us. And ask you to forgive us for our sins. We ask... For our families, we come before you and ask for our families for the same thing, Lord. 
wash and clean them. Lord, we just thank you for the food that you put on our table today, Lord. We know that it wasn't for you, a lot of us wouldn't have had a meal today. Thank you for our homes, our bed, a place to lay our head, Father. Things that people never think about thanking you for. The small things that they just overlook because they take it for granted. Because they feel that it's something that is owed to them, that it, it's supposed to come to them. But we thank you for those small things like that, brother. The water that we have to drink. And they can only see people that have to drink dirty water because that's all they have to drink. But we have clean water. Father, we want to thank you for that clean water. Thank you, Father, for being able to get into a bathtub and take a clean bath instead of have to take a bath in dirty water. We thank you for that, Father. We thank you for the heat. We thank you for all the things that we have because of your grace and your mercy, and, and you allow us to have those things, Father. We thank you, Father, for being able to worship you freely and peacefully, Father, and worship you wherever we want to. In whatever denomination we feel that we want to worship you, we can, Father. We thank you for that, Father, because so many people can't worship you. So many people at, at right now have lost their lives because they are Christian. There are so many people dying right now because they do love you and they do worship you. We thank you, Father, because we have that freedom to do that. We can worship you. Lord, we thank you for so much that we we have and we take for granted we do not thank one time not one time to give you thanks for all that we do have that you have given us and still give us power and father we thank you because you are who you are we thank you because you've given your son on that piece of wood for us and lord most of all we thank you for jesus Father, we ask you to continue to touch each and every one of us that is still in darkness and haven't seen the light, that they may come to the light before they end and repent, and that you may have their soul. And Lord, we just ask you tonight to let thy will be done here on earth as it is in your kingdom. This we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Sabbath. Truly, you have blessed us through another week, and you have given your Sabbath that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Mm. And we thank you for traveling mercies that we traveled to and from this week. We ask you tonight, Lord, to, uh, to forgive us of our sins, forgive us of anything that we've said or done or thought that we know is unpleasing in your sight. And most importantly, Lord, we ask you to forgive us for when we're disobedient. Many times we don't think that we are, but when there are things that we know to do and know what's right to do and we don't do it, that is sin. So we ask you to forgive us, Lord. Once again, we come to surrender our hearts, our mind, and our will, and we ask you to cleanse us, Lord, once again and renew our minds and renew a steadfast spirit within us. And, Lord, tonight again, we ask you to fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lead us, guide us every step of the way. Thanking you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path each and every day. And truly, Lord, we most importantly want to know your wisdom and your will for our lives. And we continue to claim your word, Lord. Help us, Lord, not to lean to our own understanding. And each and every day we acknowledge you and you said you would direct our path. And always, Lord, we want to continue to pray for healing, for strength for those that are in the hospital, those that need healing spiritually, physically, mentally, and most importantly, those that do not know you that need to surrender their lives and repent tonight. And Lord, we want to pray for those that are maybe out there traveling. We ask for traveling mercies because of the weather. And again, Lord, we give you all the praise and the honor and the glory and we thank you always for your peace your joy your strength your love and your protection and we just continue to pray for coaches we know that he continues to need donations lord and we continue to pray lord that those donations can continue to come 
Well, we know it's all in your hands, and we know you will work it out as you see fit. And we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. And may God bless you, and you have a good night. And we'll see you tomorrow night, same time, same place. And uh, we'll be lifting up Jesus and uh, having a good time tomorrow night right here on the uh, speaker radio, you know. And Lord's willing that, you know, we'll be here tomorrow to, uh, to do the same thing. And we thank you for listening. And may the windows of heaven open and pour upon you a bundle of blessings and have a good night.